Hi guys, welcome back to the 12 GMT podcast. This is episode 3. It is currently 11.38pm GMT because we're recording a late night episode because we wanted to get some, kind of just some more content in before we went live. Yeah. Um, you know, get a back catalog going and then stuff like this is easier. Um, so today it's just me, I'm Sam, I'm from Rerun Watches, this is Gabe. Gabe, plug yourself, say hi. Uh, GVB Horology on Instagram, I'm flipping watches. I don't have a website yeah. yet like Sam, but I'm getting there. We're two young watch dealers, this is what we do. Um, at kind of different stages, I guess, which we're going to speak about today. Uh, but I, I, I like podcasts where they just crack on, so should we just talk about what type of watches we deal? Because yeah. we deal in different stuff, and that's kind of why we thought we'd do this together, because it's we actually bring variety. It's not just, I don't know, all modern Rolex or anything. But Gabe, weren't you? You've now flipped your first big watch, so talk about that. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, I got my first big watch planning to flip. That was kind of like the first, first big flipper for me. But I actually, like, all at the same time listed the big watch, which I'll talk about in a second, and... um like most of my personal collection because those were like uh, three to six hundred dollar pieces and so i was like well if i can prove that selling my personal collection which are sub one thousand dollars then like it's got to be simple enough to flip a inexpensive watch and i actually only sold one of my personal watches before flipping the big boy and that that big boy watch was uh it was the Rolex Oyster Perpetual reference 116000. So the previous model to this year's with the old movement, and but it was in black dial and 36 millimeters. And I wanted to keep that thing so bad, dude. Yeah, yeah. it's a nice reference. I I knew, I've, I think I'd handled one before and I knew you'd like it, even though you don't generally go for watches that small. I was like, he's going to like this, but it sold quickly. So I don't think you got, you didn't have the chance to like think about keeping it, which is good. Yeah. And well, the thing was, I like, yeah, I didn't think 36 millimeter would be good for me. And I wore it and I was kind of like, wow, like I really want to keep this because it wears like 38 or 39 millimeters. I think it's just how Rolex designs their cases. But um, yeah, I, I, mean, I think they were, they were well. I'm used to, so Gabe and I have, Six and a half inches. We're about the same, right? Yeah. If anything, yours are slightly smaller. Yep. Uh, but I wear down to kind of 32 millimeters and up to 38. And Gabe, you're like, I guess now 36 up to 44. Yeah, I have you really know. stopped wearing my turtle. But I mean, like last year, all you would have been seeing me rocking was, you know, 42 to 44 millimeters because, I mean, it just felt right. And now because of you, I can't stop wearing smaller watches. <laughs> smaller watches are more affordable it's kind of a it was a symptom of me not having money as a college student and then also that's english college not american college i'm still a american college student I'm, i go to university um yeah having less money and also like being conscious about having skinny wrists because if you wear smaller watches as a skinny guy it actually looks really good so this right. watch should we do a wrist check i guess we should yeah um this is a 35 millimeter zodiac hermetic it's real nice i've had this a long long time mm, just I... real simple Ooh. it's nice um, the numerals really really make that one pop yeah nice loom well it was loomed it's now like decayed loom which looks really nice i've had this watch a long time but it just got serviced um and is now actually up for sale kind of one of those pieces that I knit. Well, actually, I, I did say I was keeping it at one point. Uh, but I should probably sell for the sake of the business. So it's right. up for sale now. Um, and very affordable because it's it's chrome. It's not steel. So if oh, it was steel, it would be worth a lot more. Um, but it's just really good condition chrome. So Yeah, I've on got on, surprisingly, not wearing the Grand Seiko. Today, I'm wearing the Black Bay 58 Blue. A nice it's i mean oh, your webcam focuses really nicely i need to get uh, on board with them this is the that first was like time how I, much was that uh 70 bucks i almost bought one for 200 and then i realized that i wasn't gonna like be streaming video games so i was like ah i'll save some <sighs> cash honestly it seems good it, it focused on that really quickly and watches are small so it can be yeah it snapped in pretty quick 
It's not doing uh, it now. I got, I got, I think I'm too <laughs> close now. First time using the well, webcam, really, so. Yeah, it, I like it. It's good quality. All right. Yeah, so that's already, I guess that's a vintage inspired piece, to be fair, but you're generally the modern watch guy. I'm generally the vintage watch guy. Right. I have, I think, oh, three modern watches on my desk, but one of them's the Baltic, which mm. is vintage inspired. Um, so kind of still vintage, but just new instead. Yeah, I mean, um, I've got only one vintage watch. I, yeah, it's one of only a couple I've ever had, and I've had this one for. It's probably been over a year. It's that King Seiko, the, the from nineteen sixty nine. I can't remember the exact reference, but it's got the medallion case back. It's got the high beat. You know, it's a great watch. It's, it's super affordable too. Yeah, it's what you'd want out of a King Seiko, I think. Um, I've been tempted by those those for years, but I just didn't. I know Vintage Shaco is such a rabbit hole that I'm not fully down yet. So, like, I know a lot of guys who are, and I, I really admire it, but I stick to mostly Swiss, um, which sells well too. So, the problem you know. with those Vintage King Seikos, at least the reference that I have, the case back is sealed. So, they cannot be opened through the case back. So, the only way that they can be serviced <laughs> is by taking out a little screw on the side of the case and then going in through the crystal. So, mm. it's like, I don't know how many guys out there, you know, still are servicing that way, but um, my watchmaker can do it because he off. I had a Seiko Lobmatic, which are also great watches, which was one of the first pieces I flipped. Yeah. I bought to flip, so it wasn't. I re I ended up really liking it, um, but it had a date wheel issue, which is common on those models, um, and I would have had to have like a full service to get it fixed. I couldn't afford it. So I sold that thing like a twenty pound profit. So it wasn't a great business move, and it took a while to shift. Um, but the bracelet on those is great. Like mm -hmm. people roast Seiko bracelets, but that's a really good Seiko bracelet. Um, and the case is pretty similar to King Seiko, so nice and angular and well, pretty which, stylish, I think. Which dial did you have on that? Because those Lord Maddox can get pretty sweet. It was like a taupe dial. It was like gray to not brown it's like a nice shade of brown um, oh, depending yeah. on the light so there's some good pictures like some of the first actually the first picture on my personal instagram or personal watch instagram i should say which is at sam mill dot s um is a lawmatic because it was quite a good photo i took ages ago so i kept it up um oh i just reached 200 posts that was cool oh sweet yeah i um i posted my cwc because i like that watch a lot and it means a lot to me and I wrote a little kind of thank you to everyone who's, I uh, you know interacted with, including you guys, because um, I get to do cool stuff in watches now, and it's um, a bit of a blessing, you know. But now I'm like stuck on post two hundred because I don't want to ruin the number. Um, so I'm posting like four days, but you know, that's all right. As business posts to do instead, you know, bigger fish to fry. Yeah. Right. So. We kind of spoken about what we what we sell currently, and I guess you're. I've kind of settled into this because I like I already know what I want to sell, and I'm kind of selling it to an extent. Uh, but you know, what do we aspire to sell? I kind of want to cover that because we're young watch dealers. Hopefully, we're going to be in this for a few years at least, if not decades. I'd love to do this forever. It's great. Yeah, same. So after. Your first, you know, Rolex OP, which I guess is a semi-hype Rolex now, right? It's like... I mean, I'll tell you what, I sold it for right under 8000 which, you know, in 2019, you can go into a Rolex store, and I actually talked to a guy on Instagram. He was curious how much I sold it for, because he has the same exact, like, Black 36 OP. He was like, I'm just curious, like, what the market value is, and I told him, and he was like dang, like four years ago, I walked into a Rolex and I could pick whatever color I wanted in whatever size. And he was like, you know, whatever. I don't know. They're like 5,500 bucks, right? From Rolex or something like that. Yeah, and that. Yeah. yeah, he was like, the OP is my grail, but it's hard to not want to sell it to get something else. And I was like, yeah, dude. I mean, there's big profit there. Yeah. Yeah, I wish I got... I wish I started getting money in this hobby a little, a little earlier because, like, if I was born 10 years earlier, I would have had a Submariner for 3K, you know, that type of yep. thing. Mm -hmm. But is what it is. 
Um, so what do you want to move from from there is what I'm saying. You know, more modern Rolex or, or what are you thinking? Well, I like I like the idea of modern Rolex because it's easy to sell. Everybody wants it. There's there's guys that are going to pay, you know, they're going to pay the market price for modern Rolex, you know. But since I've gotten into higher end Rolex and just researching a lot of higher end stuff, I've gotten really interested in vintage Rolex. And I know depending on what the piece is, the profit margins aren't high. Like you can still get an Oyster Perpetual in 34 millimeter from the 80s to the 70s for 2,500, 2,200 bucks. But it for me, it's like OG Submariner, you know, Tudor <laughs> yeah. Submariner. That's the stuff. I mean, it's kind of selfish because I want to get into it because I want to experience the watches while I have them. And I really... I missed out on buying a birth year Submariner when I bought the Grand Seiko and I still beat myself up for it because yeah, that's already you know. gone up in value. Yeah. 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 I guess I, there's certain vintage stuff. I really like, I really like vintage Omega. I really like vintage Zenith. Um, vintage Rolex I've handled a lot of, but I've never sold one. I guess that's kind of a goal eventually is to sell like a nice vintage DJ or an OP, as you said, that, really good value i really like the 34 millimeter case too i own a tudor with that case um so it's kind of ideal for me but i deal in like like i have uh, zenith right here which is about to go in for service which is mm. just like a super clean little vintage watch if my thing will focus like it doesn't really get better than that in terms of like condition you could just sell rarer ones which are worth more this is a pretty common one um so i think it's gonna be just under 500 pounds, which I think is great value for Zenith. Um, if you think about where Zenith is now, like it's a pretty high end brand. Yeah. And vintage Zenith is still like very affordable. Um, yeah. I mean, I feel like, like there's a huge range of vintage Swiss watches that guys just getting into watches, they're like, I want my first Swiss watch, you know. And sometimes I guess going vintage for a first Swiss piece or first piece isn't necessarily the right direction because you got to actually be worried about water resistance and, you know, all that stuff. But for that, I mean, take that Zenith. I mean, that's crazy value for money right there, especially considering yeah. the brand history, you know, finishing. I mean, like we have computers do all of our cases now. You know, that case was probably handmade. I don't know. What's the year on that Zenith? I don't know exactly. When it gets serviced, we'll figure it out. But it's a Stellina um, manual. It's a really nice movement. Manual wind. Um, but yeah, just clean and simple. But I have here, I really like this watch. And it's funny because it's like one of the cheaper ones we have right now. But it's this Tiso, which just came back from servers. Come on. Um, it's a really nice blue dial. And this is like when I was looking to get my first Swiss watch or like proper watch. This is what I would have bought if I had like been able to find one in this condition, this nice for this price. Because I bought this like so beat up, like the crystal was destroyed. Would you get in vintage watches? Just acrylic crystals chewed up. And I went like, okay, I know there's a nice blue dial under there and the movement seems to be running. So I'm just going to take a risk on it. And I'm really glad I did because firstly, the margin is really good because I bought it. Like, the guy had written off for parts, basically. Right. Um, but the hands are super clean. The dial is super clean. Obviously, it needed a full fresh acrylic. There was no polishing that. The case has scratches, but not as bad as you would think for how, like, chew like chewed up the crystal was. Um, and these movements were collaborations with Omega, so they're great. Um, and they're automatic, which is kind of a big deal in vintage watches. Um, some people don't like collecting manual wind, which is odd to me as someone who really enjoys winding watches but it's fair enough if you want it practically and yeah this is like if i had the money and i knew exactly what to look for this is the exact spec i would have bought because it's like the nicer case just simple with stick lugs and a really nice blue dial so i'm like it's funny i'm like really excited about this pretty cheap watch like yeah which has like good margins but that's not a lot of money on like a I think we're charging 275. Yeah, I mean, I totally get the being hyped about a 
I guess, quote, cheaper watch. I was yeah. in Milwaukee last week and I went to a jewelry store. It was uh, Craig Hussar's uh, jewelry, but they've got a great watch selection there. And mm. they had they had a nice uh, used case and they had, you know, an 80s bluesy and an 80s GMT Master to root beer. They had some really great vintage Rolex, but they had... I don't see many like big modern Seiko cases and they had a big case of modern Seiko. And I was like, I'm going to walk out of here with something. Yeah. I think here it's one of like the, like, you know, like lower end jewelry stores where it's all like, um, gilted. It's not real gold. It's all gilted silver. Like that's sort of like, and they sell like DNKY watches. Yep. Mm-hmm. There's one of those in the main shopping area, but then they have like, a small case of Seikos. And every time I like I walk past and I look in, that's like pretty cool stuff. Like the new Seiko Vibes are in there. The Seiko Five Sports, I mean. And like turtles. And I'm like, huh, that's cool. And like the attendant comes, I was like, can I help you with anything? I'm like, no, I'm just looking at the Seikos. Like, I just want to see what you have. You um, know that uh that King Seiko reissue that they did? Yeah. They had one of those at Hussars. And I saw, I was like freaking out because I was like, these are so cool. And she got out, she got it out for me and she gave it to me. She was like, what's so special about this? And she was just like, you know, someone who was working there. And I was like, what's so special about this? Let me tell you. And I just went on and on like about every watch she handed me. And like she didn't know about the Willard reissue and she didn't care. And it was just that King Seiko is really cool. It was three grand, but it was really cool. Watch retailers hilarious sometimes, where they're like, they're supposed to tell you what's special, right? They're supposed to sell you on it, but they're just like, it. People like this because it's good looking. It's like, yeah, come on, like if you're selling like Tag Heuer or like something that I would say is more popular to the general public, like fair enough. If you get like this is the popular dial color, which I guess is true for Lexus too, but you know, you know what I mean. Like the public will value things that. And not value things that, uh, you know, the collectors will value more. And like reissues of vintage stuff is big up there. Yeah. And they (sighs) had a, uh, they have a watch expert who's kind of their main watch retailer. Right. And I actually, I was there for Red Bar Milwaukee and that's the second time I'd gone. Yeah. And so the first time I'd gone to Red Bar Milwaukee, I met this guy, Peter. And second time when we were in Hussars, which is a great place, by the way, if you're in Milwaukee, definitely check it out. And I was talking to the girl. She was great. She was helping me out, showing me all the watches I wanted to see. And I went over to the vintage Rolex and Peter came by and he was like, you were at Red Bar last time. I was like, yeah, I was. And so he knew that I was just interested in everything. So he was bringing me pieces that were already sold. And you know that (laughs) new Seiko that kind of has like a mosaic brick like teal dial yeah i know it's like concentric bricks nearly yeah right yeah, yeah he one. he brought that out to me and I, like the thing that stood out to me most about that watch like the dial was cool but the bracelet was really high quality and oh, nice. you know seiko and their mid-range pieces and even my grand I just seiko, mentioned it. yeah 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 my grand seiko bracelet is not even it's not worth the price of the watch but I was really surprised. I think Seiko's stopping up their game on their bracelets. Nice. Yeah, is that a Pressage or a... Pros- no, it won't be a Prospects, but is that a Pressage yeah. or something? Yeah, I think it is. It has that 6R35 yeah. in it, I think. Okay, so it's that level at least. Nice. Yeah. It's definitely yeah, pricey because but... it's a limited edition. It's over 1000 but it, it was really, really sweet, I have to say. Yeah. It's... <sighs> They're cool stuff. Like... I I would I like dealing modern Seiko too because it like like Rolex there's high demand that just it turns over quickly which is good for business you know I would say watch dealing's like your main issue is cash flow and I yeah. go to business school to like whenever I talk to a professor about what I do or whatever or even just another student I'm like yeah cash flow sucks like it's just the worst thing and I think this is why a lot of watch dealers sell straps because if you get like one strap sale a day and then like a few watch sales a week those strap sales just help level things out really 
Um, whereas a smaller dealer like me, where I'm like, sometimes you go two weeks or longer without making a sale, which sucks. Um, you're like just waiting on the cash to arrive when you get do get paid, and it's like, okay, now I have things to spend this on already, and like I owe right. people money. So like, it's I think you'll find this more as you get into it, Gabe. It's a cash, cash is an issue in this business, which is why a lot of you know watch dealers borrow money, put it into inventory, and just try to turn over as quickly as possible. Yeah, which is I've... a good business model i found already that like do, well i guess you use your website do you use your website mostly for cash flow yeah so i forget which i mean the website has really good payment options and i think we pay like two and a half percent fees right. so it's it's pretty good um and like the payment processor does paypal so someone can pay me through paypal on the website and then it, we don't have to deal with paypal because paypal I think we both have bad experiences with PayPal and we're not really fans of it. We'll use it when we have to, but it's Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, Generally I've been listing website. Yeah. I've been listing a lot on Reddit because that's kind of the place where when you're small like me, uh it's a good place to get your name out there because you get some transactions behind your belt and then, you know, you can use that as you know, other people know you then from Instagram and whatever. And yeah. Everyone likes to use PayPal on Reddit, which I understand. And I had to fix that problem I had with PayPal, which I got resolved. But my problem is since I haven't used PayPal in like two, three years, like my first sale, my money is still on hold for for the Alpinist. Yeah, they can. And yeah. yeah, and now like I want to, there's another, I sent it, or there's another Oyster Perpetual that I was thinking about getting. And in that group, uh, it basically uh wire transfers the preferred payment method which i understand because it's super quick you only pay like 20 bucks for a fee when you're paying you know 55 6000 7000 whatever and it's really secure and now i have almost 9 grand sitting in paypal just pending you know and i'm yeah. like i can't buy watches because yeah, since I'm still getting into it, all, literally all of my cash is in PayPal right now, and it's kind of concerning. You're having a cash flow issue. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, and I don't trust PayPal super, like, a lot. So for, like, lots of small transactions, and, like, when we, I used to sell on eBay heavily um, when I first started this business, and we have a business PayPal for that exact reason. So I think that made PayPal trust us, and we've been, like, verified or whatever they do, which is another long process which I'll probably ask you to do too at some point. Like once you like move so much money through, they have to verify you. Um, yeah, it was always a pain. Like, pay, like eBay would say we got paid and that would be in PayPal and then sometimes it'd be held and it was just like, oh, okay. Can we yeah. just, just bank, like, yeah, bank transfers better. Like anyone I've dealt with before will probably just bank transfer me. Like good clients, I will go to their house and pick up cash rather than take paypal you know it's just a pain yeah well um, and when i bought the oyster perpetual i did it through bank wire and uh -huh. like yeah the bank asked me a bunch of security questions which i understand because they want to make sure i'm not getting scams but literally it was i walk in the bank i tell them i'm doing a wire transfer from here to here and i sign my name and i'm out there in 10 minutes you know and i'd rather get my money immediately or send my money immediately than wait my holding time on PayPal is 21 days. Yeah. yeah. So I did that, but it was like 200 quid because it was a much cheaper watch. So I kind of got lucky. Your, the fact you had a big deal go through during that 21 days sucks. Yeah, um, yeah that's rough, dude. Um, no, but talking about scamming, though, I had, I had one person. And like, I flipped watches for ages. I've had one person get really concerned that I was being scammed, and that was a postal worker. Mm. So I went into... In Birmingham, there's a really big post office. It's got, like, maybe 20 tellers. Like, they're not always all, like, manned, but it has 20 tellers, and you can go check out. Um, and you kind of get your ticket and wait. Um, and I think it was, like, a 400-pound watch. I had no idea what it was. Um, and it was shipping to the States. So I went up to, so like, I knew, I knew exactly like what insurance I needed, what it was going to cost, what pack, size my package was, like everything was fine. The watch was like fully wrapped in like double wrapper, bubble, bubble wrap, like everything that I always do 
because I was pretty experienced at this point. Like, not to be arrogant, but I knew what I was doing and I knew how the postal service worked. So I go up to this lady, um, and I always do the same thing with the Royal Mail because it's annoying. They ask what it is, um, and if you say a watch, they'll go, does it have batteries? And it's every time. They go, does it have batteries? So I go, watch, no batteries. It's mechanical. I just, like, shoot that down immediately. Cause, and they're meant to ask. They're like, because um, it's batteries can be dangerous if they explode on planes or something. It's a tiny battery. It's not going to happen. Anyway. She wasn't worried about that because I said it. She asked what it was. And I said, watch. And she was like, okay, approximate value. And I said, you know, four or five hundred pounds. I probably said a specific figure, but in that region. Do you know who you're sending this to? And I was like, yes, I've done business with this guy before. Which was a lie, but he had so many like good reviews. And like a friend of a friend. Are you sure this is okay? And I was like, yes, it's going to be need to be insured though. And she was like, okay. Has he already paid you? And I was like, okay, firstly, yes. Like, I don't think he would. He might have paid out me. I was like, I'm, I'm fine here. I do this. And I like didn't want to make a scene. And I was just like, yeah, just give me my receipt and I'll leave. Like, let me sign a little paperwork and I have to put a return address on it. So I'm there for a while and I'm just looking at her like, I'm not being scammed. I know what I'm doing. And like, people do get scammed in this business, but I don't think a postal worker is going to save me from getting scammed yeah. by just asking on like a, a, a transaction I'm really sure about. And I wasn't desperate to sell that watch. Um, so that it's just kind of. Like, I shipped out the Oyster Perpetual yesterday, and that's my first time shipping 1,000 plus worth of package, right? And so I go in there, and I need a printer. I don't own a printer, so I have to get my label at FedEx or whatever. So I'm working on that. Yeah. I need a printer really bad. But um, I went in there, and I knew I knew the drill. Like I gave her all the the address whatever and i answered the question about dangerous goods like batteries like you said and she was like can i ask what it, what's in the package and i said a watch and she was like okay approximate value and i was like uh eight thousand dollars and she was like oh uh okay and i was like <laughs> i was like yeah i know me too that's how i feel too and oh yeah i totally got I I learned the hard way that overnight shipping is expensive. Yeah, it's not. We have a really good service here where it's like for watches under five hundred pounds, it's like twelve pound overnight. It's like re it's really good. I forget what it's called. Special delivery or something? Raw mail special delivery. But like really good and like they guarantee it by next day. So I normally use that for like anything under five hundred pounds, obviously, and then I can top up insurance if I need to. But yeah, shipping expensive watches can be stressful. I had a guy... So this is like the big Birmingham post office I go to now because it's I live near the center of Birmingham. Um, but back home in Winchester, there's like one post office um, at the top of town. Actually, there's two, but one's in the center, one's at the top of town near where we live. Um, and the guy knows me. Like, I'm pretty sure... The girl who works the cashier went to my school. It's a very small town, right? She recognizes me. The guy working there knows me and knows I'm selling a watch. Um, but I went in. He, he always asks, of course. He doesn't just assume it's a watch because professionalism. Um, but I said, oh, it's a, a bracelet like for a watch. And he was like, oh, okay. Approximate value. And I was like, 300 pounds? And he was like, these are expensive. And I was like, yeah, it's a Rolex bracelet. And he was like, oh. It just still look at me like, how the... Because like, normally I was selling like 100 pound vintage watches, which I think was what he's expecting. But I at this time I had the Oyster bracelet for my Tudor, which didn't fit properly. That's a whole story. Uh, so I just decided to sell it and get the cash out of it. But yeah, he was just like, used to me doing my little business. And he was just like, Okay, fair enough. I was going through uh, looking for watches to buy, and sometimes I, you know, you stumble across like a Rolex dial for sale, or you know, yeah. and I stumbled across a Ever Rose Gold Daytona bezel. Oh, eight hundred dollars. 
which I really didn't think was that bad for a watch that's going for 70,000 right now. Or, that's a or big chunk longer. of gold, isn't it? If you think about yeah. like how much a gold ring goes for nowadays, that's a big chunk of gold. I know. Like, I, it makes me want to buy it just to have. <laughs> yeah, it'd be kind of a cool key ring or something, but it'd probably get scratched to, you know... I mean, think about it. you put that in a shadow box and like uh, with a black background shadow box hanging on the wall, and someone's like, "What's oh, that?" It could be art, yeah. It yeah, and cool. I'm like, "Well, that is my eight hundred dollar Rolex bezel." <laughs> That's not bad at all, to be fair. And ever is gold too. That's yeah. That's it's... not easy to replace. No, I'm surprised. What did they do? That... Like, did they bust down a Rolex and like, um, sorry, a Daytona and like, but in a custom diamond bezel it's Can gotta be something i mean That's oh funny. Well, well you know with the Everose gold daytona they're making rainbow daytonas out of them oh true yeah that's probably what it was that's a good point i forget there was an Everose rainbow but yeah i always think about the yellow gold one because that's like the most gaudy nearly there's also a <laughs> like, white yeah. gold rainbow daytona which you know i think i'd rock yeah i like the rainbow like bezels they're pretty cool but i'm much more of a muted guy, so maybe not. I do still want a yellow gold day date. Just love the gaudiness. I'll just I, fully admit to it. I found a 1999 yellow gold day date today, 36 millimeter with a champagne dial and Roman numeral, ha- uh, like uh, Roman numeral Marcus. dial. Yeah. And it was in really good condition, just been serviced, and it was $16,000. And I was like, if I had $16,000, I'd be wearing a day date right now. Yeah. I think, like, there's a lot of cool watches that you could buy for that money. But, like, part of me is just like, it would be like all the gaudiness I need in a watch, in one watch. And it's also like classic gaudy, you know? There's some yeah. good history to it. Presidents wear it. And, it's like, nah. and well, 36 mil is like a decent dressy size. So. You know, there's, uh, I'm pretty sure there's just a handful of steel day dates that exist. It's like five. Yeah, I think five. I think, like, that's the ultimate, like, literally the ultimate daily wearing piece because it's the ultimate flex. Yeah, because guys that know Rolex or that just know watches will be like, wow, he's wearing a white gold day date and he's dressing it down. And then you go up to that guy who's wearing it and he's like, no, this is steel yeah that's so cool i think one of them i know the story of one of them and it went to like some important guy at rolex was just given it because it was a prototype he was just given it as a retirement gift because like back then rolex didn't care about protecting their ip as much it was just like given to him it's like damn that's such a cool like that's he probably just thought i'll call this steel rolex a retirement gift but no that's the coolest steel rolex out there like I don't care about Pepsi GMTs or anything. Just that is same. It's probably like second place for me. First place being like certain explorers. Super cool. Okay, we are we're going to talk about the new Tudor though. The oh yeah, is it a Pelagos FXD or is it a something else FXD? Uh, no, it's the Pelagos. Yeah, I think so. Pelagos FXD. Yeah, I really like it. <laughs> I'll just start from the jump. I'm a big fan. What's, yeah. what's your initial thoughts? You well, like it too. Well, I mean, when I first saw it, I was like, eh. And my main thing with feeling that way was that I understand why it has fixed lugs, but I love bracelets on my watch. So, like, I was like, okay, it's all right. Like, I like the look. They did the crown really well because they basically gave it a Rolex crown. The, I mean, I know the intention is that it's easier to grip. And they give it an easier uh, bezel, and it's bi-directional, by the way. Um, but I got to see one in person, and I oh, was even Bar. yeah at Red Bar Milwaukee, nice. and I was also like, "Wow, it's eh." And you know, I started doing some more reading about it after I got to handle it, and like I was telling you today earlier, the connection between uh, the Marine National like uh, swimming, the combat swimming group or whatever. And the fact that they were the ones that basically specced the whole watch, you know, they were like, okay, we need fixed lugs, you know, cause we don't want to lose our watch. We need this better crown for gripping. Cause we're actually going to be like using the crown with gloves on. 
Yeah. And the bracelets too. Well, I guess the straps, they have the Velcro strap, which I actually really like a lot. I think it's like got a, that's a, like, I would put that on this. It looks that good. It's a cool look. Yeah. And that um, other one is, it's a rubber strap. Sam, I wish you could see that rubber strap in person. I think I, I think I put, well, I have a picture of it, but yeah, I haven't obviously seen it in person yet. It is so thin. And when I picked it up, I was like, oh, wow, a blue NATO. Like, this is cool. And then oh. I, I like kept handling it and I was like, is this a rubber? And they're like, yeah, it's reinforced with fiberglass. So it's stronger. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And I was like, okay, this is really cool. That's like, a good touch. So it, it just starts through like a NATO. Yeah, oh, yes, it's, yeah. A, it's, it's textured too. It does kind of give the trick of it, right? Yeah, it's uh, textured oh. like a NATO strap, like a weave, and it has uh, it, they're both single pass straps, which is really interesting. Which I guess they have to be, but um, I mean, yeah, it was you can like, you can put a dual pass on, but it's just I don't know. I feel like it's clunky with thick spring bars, but yeah, I'm this... wondering if no, go ahead. I'm I'm wondering if there's enough room to put you know, a generic double pass NATO in through the lugs. Yeah, there should be. Um, oh, I guess it depends how you put your NATOs on. But yeah, but I was thinking about this and I was like, oh, fixed lugs aren't for everyone. Da, da, da. I own a watch with fixed lugs that I really like, which is a CWC G10. And oh, it's, yeah. And I was like, these are welded lugs too. And it doesn't bother me. It's just... And I think both of these lend themselves to casual wear. So, like, NATOs make sense. Especially if you kind of have the same style as me. Or I think a lot of younger guys like NATOs. I think it's just a thing. Um, and my second point on this is that Tudor makes really great NATOs. Like, I think they have a place in France that custom weaves them for them. Yeah, it's France. It's the last, the last of those certain uh, looms. They're the only ones yeah. that exist. So they're probably insanely good. Did you play with the Velcro? I liked the Velcro a lot. I thought I actually Savannah was like, are these the ones that are made on those fancy looms? And I was like, I, I don't know if they are, but um, I would assume they are. I, don't I think would they think would so too. It. Yeah. It's probably got different materials to be tougher than the standard NATO, but it's probably still. It was a lot thicker than the regular NATOs. Yeah, but I mean that's a custom a loom that like basically just works for Tudor, right? So right, it's probably all custom work. Yeah, it's cool, and like, and I was also thinking about the. Oh no, I forgot the name of it. What's the thing they released last year that was really controversial? The P zero one. Yeah, the P zero one or the zero, which was like, which was much more marmite. No zero one, I think. Yeah. There's like I don't remember the name of that watch. I just know it's like the ugly Tudor no one likes, but some people do like. I don't my I don't hate it, but it's definitely like the Marmite choice. You know, and I this actually is, like, way more appealing to most people. I yeah. they had a P zero one, uh, at Red Bar, and I'd never really I'd seen photos, but I never played with one, and it actually like wears really well. It's really surprising. It's, I've heard that, yeah. It's super ugly. It's, like, so <laughs> ugly. And I actually met... That's where I met Ty, Ty Alexander, uh, watch photography. Okay, yeah. And I was talking with him, and we were looking at the new Pelagos and the the P01, and he goes, man, if I had $4,000 to spend right now, I would buy this, put it in the safe, and never take it out. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. yes. Not a bad idea. They can't be selling many of those, like, honestly. Uh, well, I wouldn't be surprised. The reason that they brought it out for Red Bar is in hopes that they'd sell it at Red Bar. And I oh, heard really? one of them say, like, I heard one of them, one of the workers say, yeah, if we don't sell this tonight, we're putting it in the safe for 40 years to see how much it's worth. And I was like, a lot, probably. The auction results will not be great to see. Um, Yeah, I think I've asked my local AD about I've asked one of them. I haven't asked both of them. But I asked them about it when they came out. And they were like, I don't think they got an allocation. Like, I just don't think. Oh. Or they they might have got one and just sold it and not told me. Because like, I, I didn't want to see it. But... Did I show you? Like... Go on. I, well, like, none of like the secondhand deals I've been to have them in stock ever. 
it's the type of thing you source. It's not the type of thing you keep in stock normally. So, right. Because it's like, it's a sports watch, but it's not hype. That's just too Marmite. Anyway, go ahead. Did I tell you, or I can't remember if I sent it to you guys. It was a photo of two different Pelagos FXDs next to each other. There's the retail one for the retail market for us that is the one that everyone's seen online and it has four lines of text. And there is a military issue one for the Marine Nationale that is just two lines of text. It's so much cleaner. I'm pretty sure I saw one on Instagram that was two lines of text and I didn't realize that's what it was. Yeah, those are... They're I, gonna I think be... they saw... Someone wrote like two lines is superior or something. Oh my gosh. I saw them side by side <laughs> and apparently they're going to be releasing the two line in an extremely limited run. But I Probably mean, for VIPs, yeah. Well, in the two, the two lines are specifically for Marine National. So I think all it says is 200 meters and I don't know. It's, I remember it saying 200 meters, but maybe the only other thing it says was FXD something like that i can't find the photo but i'll tell you what that two line like it's if they made that available to the public mass it would just be like the cwc because like a lot of people go after those cwcs now i remember when you got yours you know you got it for a good price and then like a couple months after you buy 89 yours, 89 pounds yeah and it's now like they're going now yeah and more in the States, actually. That's 200 pounds here where they're like pretty plentiful. I can't find that tutor either, um, the two line FXD, but I definitely saw it on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, maybe someone who was at Red Bar Milwaukee posted it, to be honest. <laughs> like, that's cool. So it's like nearly like having the prototype version. That's really good. Yeah. Uh, That'd be. And it was fully piece. functional, too. I. The, the bezel is backwards. So. I don't know how to so instead of going like zero oh, to I fifteen see. clockwise, it goes backwards. 50. So and I Is that don't a French thing? Is that Marine National? It has to be to their spec because I was playing um, yeah, with it. That must have been custom. I just don't understand it, but I think it acts as a countdown timer instead of a count up timer. Is that true? That's the no, only thing I can think of. When you're diving with a diver watch, it's always a countdown timer. Because it goes, does this dial spin? Did you say it spins both ways? Sorry, the yeah, bezel spin both ways. Yeah, it's bi directional. So that's not traditional for a dive watch either. So they must have some way of using it. Oh, no. Didn't someone say it was something about. Oh, I think it's something to do with. Because they, they dive and swim in zigzags. And it's something about setting the angle of the zigzag. It's not timing, it's something about setting the angle of the zigzags. We put this topic on fairly last minute, so I haven't read up on it. But yeah, it was something to do with you dive in a zigzag pattern to avoid detection or something, or for whatever reason, or maybe to navigate in a straight line. But I don't really know. But it's something about orientating yourself underwater, which is interesting. Interesting. So yeah. I guess that make I'm trying to think of like the angles. So if you turn it this way. That's them pointing you 10 degrees that way. I'd have to play with one in person and then also like talk to some dive buddies. Because I'm like basic dive qualified. I'm not proper dive qualified, you know. But like who looks at their watch when they go to dive in succession with their other guys? You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I always looked at mine when I was diving, but that's because I'm a nerd and I wanted to see my watch underwater. Like it wasn't really like I was just like going, oh, pretty... And then, like, we actually had dive clocks and stuff telling us when we need to, you know, check our oxygen levels or whatever. Right. Make sure we're not running out. I always zoned out when I was diving, and I'd be like, oh, I've burnt, like, half my oxygen. I should probably tell the guy in front of me. Like, I don't know if you watched Adrian's video on the Pelagos FXT. I haven't yet. Um, uh, I was reading an article on the CWC G10 today because our friend... Um, I'm going to butcher this name, but it's Thomas Carla, Car Carla, really cool guy. He wrote an article for Warner Round, um, and he's now just been on the Warner Round podcast. And it's all about CWC G10, which is really neat. 
because he wrote about the CWC G10 and used a picture of mine mm. um, before, and he spoke to me about the CWC when he was looking to get one. So he got a Berthier one, which was really cool because they have their manufacturer dates inscribed on the back. Um, and it was cool to kind of read his take on it because now he's had it for a while and kind of been adventuring with it. Um, so yeah, just a little shout out to him. Um, I want to put the links to that article uh, in the show notes and in the description because he's a nice guy um, and hopefully we can get him on this podcast one day. Okay, so we're 47 minutes in. I think we just kind of wrap it up here. Um, I feel like that was a good chat for an impromptu, impromptu podcast. But um, yeah, I think takeaway is we kind of both sell different stuff which is great also i mean i'm in the uk you're in the us we're not really competing because shipping and import costs just kill things yeah i Um, mean we talked about teaming up but it's just so unrealistic unless we live in the same place yeah if you move over here it'll definitely be a partnership at some point um and i think we have similar directions we want to go in which is great yeah we should talk about those eventually like the aspirations of watch dealing and where we want to take it um, and we both like the Tudor FXD, which is probably surprising to some, but I don't know. It seems I... like, no, go ahead. It seems like most people like it. And I was really skeptical at first and I just thought it was pretty, I just thought it was pretty boring and confusing, but it took like actual reading to understand what the watch is meant for. And then I was like, wow, okay. This thing is like genuinely really cool. Yeah, it's like a specialized, customized Pelagos. Yeah. I think if you look at it, like, it's not a whole new watch. It's just not even refined. It's more like it's a more tall version of an already very tall watch, which is really cool. And it's customized for a cool organization. And whenever something like this comes out, I always, like, give it the benefit of the doubt. Like, it's probably really cool. Like, even the PO1, I know I kind of called it ugly. I was like, it's probably cool. Some people will love it. Like you just It's pretty ugly. Got it. It is pretty ugly. You gotta give it the benefit of the doubt and it's gonna have fans, so yeah, I mean anyway, if you think is... about it if you oops, sorry. If you think about sorry. it, um the Pelagos FXD is just literally a military issue watch that the public can also buy. So there's yeah. gonna be people that don't like it. And, you know, in forty years people are gonna be buying the Pelagos FXD the same way that the hype on like your CWC is just, you know, they're going to be classic. 100%. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so we wrap up now. That is episode three of the 12 GMT podcast. <laughs> We're ending at 12 26 a.m. GMT. Hey, but that's okay. <laughs> Next time we'll, uh, we'll do it on the weekend again and we'll have better timing for both of us. But um, yep. anyway, thanks for watching, guys, or listening, or whatever you're doing. Please like. We'll leave a review once we're on podcast platforms. Um, And we'll be back next week. Yep. See you guys.